And we are live for another Roto World Baseball Q and A. It's Eric Smolski joined today by Chris Crawford. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Eric. I'm excited to be uh, back with Roto World and excited to be chatting with you. It's been uh, a fun start to the MLB season, and I'm excited to see some good questions today. Yeah, we're excited to have you back. Um, uh, you know that the enthusiasm you have and the enthusiasm for you was, mm. you know, contagious over <laughs> over Twitter. Um, so we are going to get into, you know, a typical uh, Q&A questions during the day. We obviously have uh, some some big things to talk about yesterday. In particular, we saw the earliest no hitter ever thrown in Major League Baseball uh, by exactly the person you would have expected it to be. Totally. By. Um, yeah. Uh, before we get to the questions, I'm just curious, you know, you do you have any major takeaways from, you know, the first five days of full MLB action? Yankees look really good. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that I yeah. came away with, uh, my, my Seattle Mariners, uh, who I apparently own cause I just called them my Seattle Mariners, <laughs> uh, got off to a really rough stuff uh, start offensively, you know, mainly I'm just kind of paying attention to see how the ball's tracking, how the ball mm -hmm. is in the air, you know, like I think we've seen some Marine layer slash cold air stuff that affects some balls that I think will definitely get out of the park in July. And I've seen. Right you know, some really strong pitching performances. It's and we usually do. Um, yeah. By the way, my biggest takeaway too is why we play games on the East coast in these early games where there are <laughs> perfectly good stadiums on the left side sure. of this country. Why are we still doing this? But uh, yeah, it's been fun. It's been a um, seeing that no hitter last night was awesome. Like, yeah. you know, as a Mariner fan, I'm supposed to uh, root against that team from Houston, but I can't. And Ronel Blanco is an amazing story. A 30 year old, doing mm -hmm. that is it's signed. really cool against a really good lineup as well right signed for five thousand dollars is like a 22 year old when you know guys are getting signed at like 16 um it is a really cool story it's yeah. unfortunate that we're following it up with the first game today is at 4 10 and it's probably going to get rained out um, oh. and so as you mentioned there's that enthusiasm that we want to sure. keep going um we're going to start getting to your questions as a reminder just put the the Post questions in the chat. We will get to them. Um, you know, ask us anything you have. If you're asking specific roster questions, you know, it's always helpful to just talk to us about the league type, the the league size, things like that. Can be useful. Sure. That kind of information can be useful. Um, Chris and I will do our best to give a wide ranging um, set of answers to those questions, just so we can help as many people as possible um, in the chat. And that's relevant uh, to this first one, which is from Dave Slick. And he asks, would you drop Stanton in order to stash Wood? I assume we're talking about James Wood here. Um, obviously, in the, the league types, I would assume we're talking about a redraft league here as well because James Wood is probably rostered in almost every sort of you know keeper and dynasty type of league. So would you be dropping Stanton um, in order to stash James Wood? I'd be awful tempted to do it. It would partially be depend on... You know, can I take that hit with Giancarlo Stanton's batting average? And that would probably weigh in this decision quite a bit, you know, because I do think this is a guy who's going to hit 215 to 220 for the rest of his career. And it is tough mm -hmm. to justify, especially with the health stuff. Uh, I have James Wood as my number three overall prospect for redraft leagues, uh, just behind uh, Junior Caminero and Jackson Holiday. And by the way, we got good injury news on Junior Caminero, a quad strain, but they were saying it's only going to be a minimal amount of time. James Wood's a really special offensive player. He's six mm -hmm. foot seven. He's built more like an edge rusher than he is a outfielder, but he's actually a really good athlete, plus plus power. I think the average might be a little bit of a concern this year, but I think long term, you're but you're talking about this year. So you're talking about a 40 grade hit tool, 230, 240. But that's better than Giancarlo Stanton. And the fact that James Wood can also steal bases and also just the overall upside he provides. Now Stanton's got a lot better chance to drive in runs because the Nationals lineup is, whew, that is yeah. not a fun one to watch. But yeah, I think if I had the roster resource and I was had, trusted the rest of my bench, I think I would drop Stanton for Wood. Yeah, I think it, it depends on where you're at. I, you know, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we probably see Wood until August. Oh, I would right? think like I would think mid-May. Like just Mid the fact. Oh, you really think they're going to come up that early? Yeah, okay. I think. One, I think the important thing here is the organization. The Nationals have been aggressive with these type of players before. And number two, if he had started in double A, I would be going with that July, August timeline. Right. But because he's already playing in triple A with Rochester, I do think they're going to be aggressive. Obviously, a lot of it's going to depend on the start. The how right. he plays in triple A is going to be a big factor in this. 
Yeah, then I mean, if you if you're acting on a, a May timeline or even a June timeline, sure. um, I think you know I would be inclined to try to give Stanton a, a little bit more time because obviously, sure. as you mentioned, it was a good first weekend for the Yankees. That lineup could be pretty strong all around, mm-hmm. adding Soto and somebody like Verdugo who isn't you know, who isn't exciting, but makes a lot of contact. So he gets on base. Yes. Um, And so that could create some value for, for Stanton as well. Uh, But I don't think that this type of swap is out of the realm of Mm -hmm. possibility. Um, You're going to be shocked at who leads the the player. We're getting asked the most questions about, Um, but it's the first name here in Ronald Blanco, Brady Singer, Jared Jones, Tanner Houck. How would you rank these guys? Let's just assume we're in kind of a standard 12 team redraft league. Um, how would you rank these four starters? This is an interesting one. I would probably, you know, as good as Blanco looked, and I just took a look at the Savant page. He was deserving of that no hitter. He mm-hmm. had an expected batting average yesterday of 105. So a little bit lucky, I guess, technically <laughs> to, to get the no hitter by a hundred points, but no, um, I would probably rank these guys. I am a huge Jared Jones fan. I wanted to put him in my top 10 prospect list to mm-hmm. open the year, but they didn't give me the chance because he made the team. I'm going to go. Jones, Blanco, Singer, Hauk. I am not a big Hauk believer. I believe he profiles still better in relief. I think the fact that he got to face a double A baseball team in the Oakland Athletics helped, helped an awful lot. Sure. Oh my gosh. That team, there are some really bad baseball teams, Eric. Like mm-hmm. watching the the Rockies and the White Sox and the Athletics this weekend has been I must have done something bad in a poor life because they are <laughs> awful baseball teams. But yeah, I think that would be my order. Jones, Blanco, Singer, Hauk. Fair. Um, I, I agree with you that I think that that Blanco earned a lot of what we saw last night. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there this isn't a total flash in the pan. Um, there's still a chance that he's not in the rotation by June when Verlander's back point. and Urquidy's back. Um, mm-hmm. And so we we do need to keep that in mind. I think he might be a better option than, you know, than JP France to stick when Verlander comes back. So he's got a little more leeway. Jones for me is the clear number one. Um, mm-hmm. I wrote about him as much as I could in in the preseason. Um, I think the upside is really good there. He's thrown 122 and 127 innings in the minors the last couple of years. So 140 should be in the realm of possibility for him. I, I am putting Hauk number two though. Okay. Um, I really did like what we saw from him. Um, I also just really like what the Red Sox are doing with, you know, Andrew Bailey kind of being open and saying, listen, we're not, going to lean on our fastballs he considers the fastball i loved the analogy that he said the fastball is a jab sure um and the off-speed pitches are the knockout punches and you want to use the jab sparingly to set up the knockout pitches and he was mentioning that even in like if even if you just want to throw a strike you don't have to rely on the fastball to throw a strike you can rely on other pitches to throw a strike um, and so I really love the way the Red Sox as a pitching staff leaned on their their non fastballs early on. I think that's going to be good for Hauk because, you know, his slider is really good. Um, yeah. The you know, the he's, you know, throwing a cutter a little bit more now. Um, don't only use it 7 percent of the time against the A's, but they didn't have a lot of lefties. And again, not a lineup you really need to like dance around. Sure. Uh, but he's got the cutter now to help mitigate some of the, the problems against lefties. Um, that splitter can be filthy, you know, uh, looked really good last night. Um, we'll take it as it comes. I mean, he gets the angels this weekend, so I don't know that he's going to get that much more of a test. Um, but then I'll, I'll put Blanco ahead of singer because, you know, I know singer had a great first start, but for me, there wasn't really anything new in what he was doing. Um, and so I think you're going to see the same thing with Brady singer where like some starts, he looks electric and you're like, man, that's great. And then some starts, you know. He's basically a sinker pitcher with an inconsistent slider. Um, right. I know he claimed he was working on a sweeper in the offseason. We didn't see that in the first start. It was the no. same slider. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not really I'm not going to adjust too much. That's fair. Um, yeah. We got a hitter question. Nice. Though. Uh, so Rhino asks us. What's going on with the Cubs? And Nico Horner, should I be concerned? He's not batting leadoff consistently. Um, so should you be concerned about Nico Horner? Um, if you're looking at his game log right now, again, we're not talking, you know, we're, we don't have that many starts to start the year. He's hit lead off once and he's batted seventh three times. Right. Um, it appears as though against lefties, he's going to probably lead off and against righties, 
Um, he won't, and I will double check, but I believe it's because uh, against righties, they're leading. They've been leading off Ian Happ, right? Um, and so that may be. Yes, that's what that's what they're doing. So, to you, does that does that concern you about Nico Horner that he's not going to lead off against righties? A little bit, just because a lot less chance, I think, for run production. Um, I still think he's going to be a solid fantasy player, just because I mm-hmm. think he's going to help you in the average category. I think he's going to steal a solid number of bases. But I would really like to have that hitting at the top of my lineup just to get those chances to get driven in by Cody Bellinger and Christopher right. Morrell, who has looked fantastic over these first five games. That concerns me a little bit. I would imagine at some point Horner's going to move into that leadoff spot against uh, to move yeah. into the top of the lineup. You know, hitting him seventh. Seventh is probably like the worst fantasy position you can have other than I, I guess eighth would be a little bit worse. But seventh is a little bit frustrating because you see all those guys getting driven in by the four, five, six, and you watch him hit at the top. And you don't get to get a chance to get driven in by very good players with your right. eighth and ninth hitter sitting behind him. So, yeah, I would certainly prefer it, and it would be something I would keep an eye on going forward. But I still think Nico Horner is going to be a pretty solid fantasy option. Yeah, I, I agree with you, too. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned it might hurt run production. It's not really going to hurt stolen base production, right? right? If you're on base and the 8-9 hitters are up, in fact, yeah. you might even see him run more than he might if the heart of the order was up. And I think the primary reason you drafted Nico Horner was for his batting average and his stolen base totals. Sure. And so the, those two main things won't be impacted. The overall value might be hurt a little bit by by the overall runs. But right. I, I wouldn't – this doesn't drastically change how I would value him. Fair. Um, we've got another Ronald Blanco question. I think we kind of covered this. But the question is just how much more does he have to do to, to nose ahead of JP France when Verlander is ready? Um, I, I brought up that I think not that much more. I mean, you know, he probably has two, three more turns in the rotation before Verlander is ready. Um, and if he looks even half as good as he did now with that slider change up combination, uh, I think he can outlast JP France. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think JP France is a much better real life pitcher than a fantasy mm-hmm. pitcher. Just that the six inning three run starts that are going to be valuable to the Astros at the back of their rotation just aren't as valuable, even if you're getting that W uh, because he, I don't think he's ever going to be an elite bat misser, but I do think Blanco has to pitch. Well, like there certainly isn't a locked in spot for him in the rotation. Um, If he does this again, uh, I think he probably might be cemented for a little bit. Yeah. For Um, a long time. But yeah, I mean, just based on the eye test and just the results on, you know, not even including the no hitter last year, he was, Pretty darn good in a sample. The metrics really like Ronald Blanco. Um, yeah, I don't think it will take much for him to keep that spot over uh, over JP France. Yeah, fully agree. Um, reminder: we're going to keep getting to all your questions. You know, we're sticking around here till about one one forty five ish. We're going to get to them as much as possible. So put in. You know, we have a, a slog we're getting through. I see him right now, but you know, get get your questions up there, and we'll get to as many of them as as we possibly can. Um, we're going to go back to another question. Um, from Rhino, and this kind of fits in with you know a little bit of your wheelhouse, but just who did you believe is a better hold? Again, I'm assuming redraft leagues here between Jackson Holiday and Junior Caminero. Um, the Junior Caminero quad injury doesn't seem to be as scary as we maybe thought initially. Right. Um, I feel like Jackson Holiday is a better hold because I see more of a path to like full time playing time once he's up. But I'm curious if you would agree with that. Totally. He's number one on my prospect list. And by the way, I'll promote that real quick. Every Monday, I'll have my top 10 redraft prospect lists on rotoworld.com. Really appreciate you guys checking that out. I mean, Holiday's the best prospect in baseball. The Easily the best prospect who's still in the minor leagues, as much as I love Jackson Cheerio and some other guys. And for fantasy, he is much more likely to help in all five categories than Caminero is. Now, Caminero, probably more power. Long term, I think Holiday might catch him. But right now, more power. Maybe a little bit better chance of run production because Caminero might be hitting fourth or fifth. But anywhere you're hitting in the Baltimore Oriole lineup, you're right. going to have a chance to drive in some runs. Jackson Holiday is a special prospect, and the Orioles are going to find a way to get him in the lineup. As loaded as they are in that infield, mm-hmm. Jackson Holiday is going to come up and play for this team probably by the start of May is what I would guess, assuming he's holding his own in AAA. And boy, it's but it was great to see. Never hit a home run off of a left-handed pitcher. Right. Oh, by right the way, the very first thing he does, it's open the minor league season, is homer off that lefty. It's holiday. I love both. I would love to have both on my roster, assuming that your bench is deep enough for it. But if you have to hold just one, it's holiday. 
fully agree. Um, we're going to keep the, the prospect love going for you. Um, with the injury to Josh Young, um, Josh Young obviously fractured his wrist. Uh, yeah. They say he's going to be back this year, but, you know, it's going to take some time. Sure. Uh, the Rangers are calling up Justin Foscu, who has some experience at first, at, at second, at third. Um, any fantasy value in Foscu? So let's just call it standard five by five roto. Do you believe he has fantasy value? Potentially. I'm going to be really curious to see how they go about using him. It's interesting. Uh, Foscu and Jordan Westberg, who had the walk off hit yesterday, were yeah. on that same Mississippi State team. What a fun baseball team that was to cover. And by the way, that Josh Young to to have that after the game that he had to going three for four. It's just not fair. Here's hoping he can come back because what a talented player that guy is. Mm -hmm. I think Foskey is a better. We talked about real life versus fantasy. I think Foskey is a better real life player because of his versatility and the fact that he doesn't have a real weakness. Everything's on the twenty eighty scale, fifty or so. But there's no standout tool here. And a lot of times these guys don't end up having a great fantasy track record on top of the fact that I think Ezekiel Duran is probably going to get more of the playing time than Foskey will early on. It actually is a little concerning to me that they're calling up Foskey in this situation because it makes me wonder if they don't believe he's a long term uh, everyday option because. He's not coming up and I think playing every single day. And while this guy is a borderline top 100 prospect. The fact that they're and maybe this is just a short term thing, you know, it, it could definitely be uh, a yeah. long story short. I'm probably leaving Foscu on the waiver wire. It feels like a situation where he might get some run before Nate Lowe comes back because they've sure. been playing Duran also at first a little bit. A point. But and then see, maybe he gets an opportunity to prove himself. Um, but when Lowe comes back too, then you, you have Duran, who I believe is probably higher up in the pecking order than Foscu for them. I would say, but so. can play, but can play all over. So yeah. if Foscu does handle himself well, he could maybe get semi regular bats with Duran moving all over once Lowe is back. Um, so something to consider. But there isn't. There are some obstacles here to everyday playing time. It's not like he's coming into an immediate um, spot. For sure. Uh, our guy Rhino has another question, which was, uh, can Oswaldo Cabrera keep hitting like this the rest of the season? Um, I think the easy answer is no. Yeah. Um, he's not going to keep hitting like this the rest yeah. of the season. Um, I, I have, I've never been as in on Oswaldo Cabrera as some others have, even when, when he was a, a prospect. Um, you know, I, I do think there was some power speed in the profile that we saw in the minors, nothing crazy, but enough that he can help you, you know, in a, in a lot of places or a few places. Um, I don't know that that was always going to translate over to the same type of power speed at the major league level. Like, you know, you get some chip in homers, you get some chip in steals, but you're not getting like a necessarily like a 2020 MLB type hitter was how I personally viewed him. Yeah. I know he's in a hot start to the year. I, John Birdie's not going away. No. Um, Cabrera got a lot of extra run over the opening weekend because you know you're not going to take that bat out of the lineup. And kudos to the Yankees for saying he's hitting well. We're just going to keep playing him. Um, you know, Lemayhu isn't a world beater, but he should be back in a month. And you know, I think then you're going to get a chaotic mess of all three of them. And Cabrera can move all over, play some of the outfield, but sure, I think he winds up being a fine utility. But, like, I don't know that he becomes more valuable than a guy like, you know, Willie Castro, who's also a super utility and has, like, an elite carrying tool in the speed. That's great. Um, I don't know that he's any more valuable than, like, actually, I I think he might be less valuable than what we expect of John Birdie. Because John Birdie as a super utility gives you that speed historically that I don't know that you get from Cabrera. But you might have more insights from his prospect days. Nope. The only thing I'm going to add to that is either Oswaldo Cabrera or Oswald Peraza needs to change their names. Like one of them needs to become Steve because I get them confused constantly. Now, everything he said, nail on the head. You take a look at those numbers that he's putting up. They're really impressive. They're also extremely lucky and not all that different from the numbers he put up last year, which were we weren't talking a whole lot about him in fantasy circles. Uh, Good for him. Uh, Really nice real life player again but at such limited fantasy upside. Agreed. Um, we're going to talk about some bounce backs. Um, Cow Chad asks, rank on whose second start bounce back, bounces back strongest of Pepio Freeland, Boyle, 
Freed, and Ober. It's such a wide range here. Yeah. Uh, to me, there's a very clear top of this bounce back, but I'm curious of Pepio, Freeland, Boyle, Freed, and Ober, who you believe bounces back the strongest or how you would rank those in terms of bounce backs. Yeah, Freed won one pretty easily yeah. for me. It's worth pointing out, too, that if you have a competent umpire, he gets out of that inning and oh, right, exactly. pitch right down the middle of the plate and gets called a ball and then just can't find the strike zone afterwards. Um, I was concerned at first that there may have been something injury related, but I'm super happy that Atlanta pulled that guy because 43 pitches in the first inning, why in the world risk it this early right. in the season? I still think Max Freed, a flawed fantasy pitcher, just because I don't think he has elite sw miss, swing and miss stuff, excuse me, but I think he'll bounce back just fine. And then I would probably go Ober, Pepiot, 10,000 pounds of you know what, and then Kyle Freeland. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and also, and then after Kyle Freeland, even 10,000 pounds more and Joe yeah, Boyle. Yeah, of Joe Boyle, um, I forgot. You know, <laughs> Joe Boyle threw a couple of strikes in like his first or second spring start, and everybody was like, oh, he figured out <laughs> command. Um, he yeah. didn't, and if you watched that start last night, he did not figure out command. Um, nope. Fully agree with you. Uh, do not let one start change your opinion of guys you've been putting months of work into. You know, Freed and Ober were people, were pitchers who were very highly regarded. I believe that they are still going to be really strong. Ober has been a command guy in the past, so him not having command in the first start to me feels more flukish than anything. Um, and then I, I put the two of them on a separate level from Pepio. Um, you know, Pepio was not going to pitch to the ratios that he showed in the short season, but I do like that he's elevating fastballs more in Tampa. There are things I saw that I like. Um, I'm I'm just not in on Freeland and Boyle, um, and so I, I I'm not really banking on a bounce back there. Same. Um, this is an interesting question. I think the answer is not high on Jared Jones, but how would you sell high on Gavin Stone or Jared Jones? So when you get these young pitchers who come up and look pretty good, right? For you. When do you decide, yeah, I'm going to sell high on this particular player or when I'm going to get a hold firm and figure out that there's going to be some season long value? Sure. And again, definitely talking redraft here because definitely not selling Jared Jones in dynasty leagues or keeper leagues. Um, this is an interesting question and it's a tough one because like selling high, like for instance, if somebody got really discouraged from watching Max Freed pitch and offered me Max Freed for Jared Jones, I'm, I'm jumping on that. You know, mm -hmm. I really like Jared Jones, but I still think there is so much more floor with some ceiling as well with Freed. But you're not just selling him for the sake of selling him, right? Like th there's there's too much swing and miss potential in this guy. The command has gotten so much better over the last couple of years uh, as a card collector guy i have yeah. many jared jones cards that i am uh, just barely hanging on to right now it's so tempted to go list them on that four letter site but gavin stone would be somebody i would sell high on absolutely i like gavin stone and i think that there were actual signs that suggested that he was better in 2023 mm -hmm. than those numbers were now you would hope so because those numbers were terrible right like right. he was among yeah. the worst starters in baseball but there's a reason why he was a top 50 prospect coming into the year. There's a reason why some people liked Gavin Stone considerably more than Bobby Miller. So certainly mm -hmm. don't have to trade these guys. To answer your question, though, I probably, if somebody's offering me something real good for Gavin Stone or Jared Jones, I'm taking it. But if you are, um, you got to wait a few starts, I think. Like before you like explore that trade market, you got to, I think, wait at least a couple of starts. Yeah, I, I am with you on that. I would sell on Stone more than Jones. I am a little bit more wary of, of pitchers who's who lead with a changeup. Um, I think it's it is not in it usually is not a great sign for consistent strikeout upside, right? Because especially right handed pitchers to right handed hitters, the changeup is not a great strikeout pitch. I know that he added other pitches to his arsenal, but mm -hmm. the changeup is really still the driver after the first start. And so right. I'm a little bit less high on, on Gavin Stone. I also think he gets less of just a hey, take 130, 140 innings, see what happens. Than Jared, the Jared Jones, who I believe will get that kind of run. Yeah. Um, just a quick question of, do you read the Twitch chat? Yes, we do read the Twitch chat. If you want to ask us uh, questions in Twitch, you can do that. Um, we get them 
but we get questions both from Twitch and from YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. So ask the questions wherever you're at, and I'll make sure I get as many up there as possible. The question below is the most flattering thing I've heard in a while. <laughs> he was wondering if we're guys are father and son. I'll take it. Compliment. Thank you. Uh, I'm well, guessing that I'm father because of the gray beard. I was going to say, I don't think the age difference is that drastic. <laughs> no, <laughs> probably not. Anybody's father probably and son. Not. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting question from Rhino. Uh, just in general, it's a, it says he asked Jordan Walker, Nolan Gorman, Nolan Gorman, Norman, Jesus, Norman <laughs> Gorman. It's but it's Nolan. Yeah, yeah. Nolan Gorman are killing yeah. me early on. Should I be concerned about one or both these players going forward? I just want to put this up there because I think it's important to just continue to acknowledge that it's been five days. Yes. Um, for some of these guys, it's been three or four games. Mm -hmm. And so, no, you shouldn't be concerned. Um, you know, we don't want to throw away weeks or months of prep based on this little information. Sure. Um, obviously, like we want to take in the information. We want to see things that are interesting. We want to see things that have changed. But But I can't treat four or five days of a player's performance as some new level of skill. I think that Gorman and Walker both were really intriguing young hitters who I think had every, we'd have every reason to assume they're going to take a step forward. Um, and so I'm not willing to believe, especially after they, they face the Dodgers who are probably yeah. the best team in baseball in the first yeah. series yeah. that there, that there's anything here. No, absolutely not. I think both of those guys are going to be in the long term, really good players in particular Walker, one of my favorite offensive prospects. In fact, I saw a number just a little bit ago that really encouraged me. His chase rate is among the best in baseball among these first five games, which is a really impressive thing to see for a guy who I think is 13 years old. I The last time I checked, <laughs> yeah. right around that. No, no concern. Um, I would love to see Walker hitting higher in the order. We talked about the seventh thing, but that's sure. just not going to happen for a little bit. But yeah, don't give up on those guys. Don't do not do it. Uh, here's an interesting roster construction question. Uh, Jordan has Walker Bueller, Verlander, and Senga on the IL. Oh, wow. Uh, should I hold Josh Young till one comes back and then obviously flip-flop or go ahead and drop Josh Young? Um, he also already has Jackson Holiday eating up a spot on the bench. Um, so this is a really great question in terms of like really a reason why you don't want to draft so many injured guys. And who knows when – when Jordan did his draft, these guys, you know, Senga Verlander, those guys may have not already been hurt when Jordan did his draft, but we have to assume guys are going to get injured early. So you don't really want to fill your IL spots. Um, for me, like I think Verlander is the closest of that group to coming off the IL and he mm -hmm. still might be three weeks away. Um, if you already have Jackson holiday on your bench, I, I, I think you might have to drop, drop, Josh Young here, assuming this is not like a keeper league of any kind, right? Because you also don't know what type of power loss he's going to experience coming back from the fractured wrist. So let's say he even comes back, you know, I don't like the timeline of this is also so rough. Like it depends yeah. on how he responds. I mean, TJ Friedel fractured his wrist and he's pacing to come back in like two and a half months, yeah. um, two months, two and a half months. So if you do that and Josh Young comes back, middle of June, July. What if he doesn't have his power until August? Yeah. You know, then you're looking at maybe six weeks of real, the Josh Young we've come to expect. Sure. Um, and can you hold for those six weeks? I, I don't know. It's, it's tough this early in the season. It's really hard. If I was going, if, if you really wanted to keep young, I think it's really interesting. Like which of those three pitchers would you drop Eric? Oh, that's so tough. Um, it would weirdly be, it would weirdly, uh, on talent, it would be Bueller. Yeah. Um, I'm just not sure. Like, we were seeing declining results on the fastball beforehand. Um, I don't really know. You know, I think that Senga was really good in the second half of the year. If I'm taking the health component into it, Senga's injury scares me the most because that yeah. shoulder capsule thing, um, it's it's the riskiest of all of them. Yeah. Um, so he is probably the highest upside of the trio and the lowest floor, but I think that's kind of what the IL spot is for. Right. Um, right. and then Bueller and Verlander are both guys who are really strong, solid floor pitchers who maybe don't have the ceilings they used to have. Um, and so maybe I would keep one of those two, mm -hmm. but I, I think my answer is definitely to, to drop young in this situation. For sure. And what I would be looking to do, uh, is making a trade, like seeing if somebody's sure. interested in, you know, adding one of those guys to your roster because they should be, you know, most people probably don't have, that's just horrible injury luck, buddy. That is, right. that is very, very sad stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's who I would be dropping as well. It's it's that's so tough. That is such a tough thing. And by the way, I kind of wish that you could play with like a 15 day IL and a 60 day IL in leagues like that. Like sure. just have one guy that okay, you've got three injured list spots. Well, then let's add one more for the 60 day. You know what I mean? But oh, this, like, that could be interesting. Some sort, some, some sort of weird rule, like like you have to add this guy by a certain point or or whatever. I think that would be an ideal little situation, especially just with pitchers are going to keep getting hurt at a crazy rate. This is yeah. an unnatural motion. We are still evolving as a species. Uh, this is going to be something that uh, keeps happening. So adding that little 60 day IL spot might be a pretty good I do idea. Like that. I do like the 60 day thing. That's, that's yeah. an interesting roster construction um, solution. Another yeah. roster construction question here. Um, if Estre Ruiz was dropped and we can stash in an NA spot, it's worth it right is the question. Um, my answer is going to be no yeah. on that. I do not believe it's worth it. Yeah. Um, I have not been big on Estre Ruiz. Um, I got into a lot of people came at me on, <laughs> on Twitter for suggesting that I think Victor Scott is a better overall hitter than Estre Ruiz. I know Estre Ruiz had a great one season in the minors. Right. Um, I don't love a lot of his swing decisions. Um, I get that like everybody is citing his OPS after seven at bats to start the year. Um, again, we talked about that with Jordan Walker and Nolan Gorman, like yeah. seven at bats doesn't yeah. throw out the sub 700 OPS of last year. But here's the issue. It's very clear that the A's reasoning for sending him down is garbage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you have a team that very clearly doesn't want him on the active roster and right. are giving a lot of, you know, word salad to the reasons why they sent him down. Um, but there seems to be no, I would, uh, that doesn't give me confidence that they're going to bring him up if he has a good two or three weeks in the minor leagues. Yes. I, I feel like there's more of a chance that they hope he gets hot in AAA for a little bit so they can trade him to another team. But keep in mind, he's 25 years old and on his fourth organization yeah. because there are major defensive issues and there are hit tool issues. And he perhaps profiles best as a fourth outfielder who can do what Dyron Blanco did last night for the Royals, mm. where there was a bloop single and the Royals brought Blanco into pinch run and he stole second and he stole third and he tied the game in the ninth inning on a sack fly. And maybe that's Estre Ruiz's future is to be sure. that kind of player mm -hmm. and so so no i i wouldn't use an na spot on that i think there are so many hitters in the minor leagues right now with the potential to come up by may who could have a much greater impact on your fantasy team no question about it by the way did you see mark kotze's comments today that mm -hmm. if miguel and Andujar yeah was healthy that they would have which is <laughs> Talk about whatever the opposite of darning with faint praise is. That yeah, is exactly. Not, exactly. All due respect to Miguel Andahar. But yeah, I mean, he just doesn't make enough hard contact. Like, and as good as that speed is, and I think he can be a 60 stolen base guy, 60 stolen base guy really easily. There's no way I'm stashing Ruiz over guys like Jackson Holiday, uh, Junior Caminero, uh, Pete Crow Armstrong, who is a better version of uh Esturi Ruiz there's just too many guys that I would much rather have on my roster I mean if he's available and hitting at the top of the lineup and you can get him for free and you can stash him on your bench okay like but I would be I, there would be, have to be such a limited waiver wire before I'm adding Ruiz with all due respect Yes, I, I fully agree. Um, speaking of waiver wires, uh, Frank is asking, he waited too long to draft his catchers, Stevenson and Bailey, so I will assume this is maybe a two-catcher format. 15-team um, OBP league, are there any catchers that might surprise this year? Um, so by surprise, I currently, I right now just pulled up Yahoo um, and I looked at, you know, what are the, per the roster ship percentages? Um, Luis Camposano is now over 50%. He's at 56%, but he would have been the first guy that came to my mind um, in terms of he's not a huge OBP asset, but he's a, a pretty solid hitter and he's going to play every day. And sure. so I like that. Um, I'm noticing that Alejandro Kirk is still rostered in just 13% of um, Yahoo leagues. And that's because, you know, they expect some sort of platoon when Jansen's back. Uh, so I like Alejandro Kirk. Travis Darno is rostered in just 12% of Yahoo leagues right now. He is going to start for the next three weeks to a month in Atlanta with Sean Murphy um, out. So um, I, I like Darno uh, as another option. 
Um, and then like, I don't know. I mean, uh, Austin Wells has played a lot for the Yankees early on. I mean, I think that he's kind of in a platoon with, with Trevino. I don't know that I would pick Wells up over Stevenson or, or Bailey. No. Um, I, I really, and then same thing, like, um, you know, Ryan Jeffers did play three of the first four games for the twins. Um, Jeffers is a pretty good hitter. So if it turns out that Jeffers is 75% of the time and Christian Vasquez is 25%, I would probably take that over Patrick Bailey. Um, sure. So th those are kind of my thoughts is Camposano, Kirk, Darno, and then maybe Jeffers. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is really tough because like, the catcher position is improving so much, but there's still just a lot of, uh, if anybody want to make that no catcher league that I can play in, I'm all yeah. for it, man. I just would love to be in it. I'll tell you one name just to keep an eye on, to keep an eye on, if that makes sense, is Kyle Teal is, I do think, yeah. the guy who I think is going to help the Red Sox by the end of the year. And actually, especially in an OBP league, he's somebody that's interesting. His plate skills are outstanding. Mm -hmm. He was so good in the minors last year. I mean, you're not rostering him right now, but he is somebody like if anybody's looking for that – I'm desperate for catcher help type of thing. And I've got a real deep bench. Not the worst idea. Yeah, I did. Somebody in the chat is also mentioning um, Shea Langoliers. Mm -hmm. My concern is that like in an OBP league, his yeah, average is low and he doesn't really have a high walk rate. So no. um, if you needed the, I mean, if you wanted the power, sure. But again, we just talked about that A's lineup. So you're not getting like a ton of runs and RBIs. Um, right. And so that that's a little bit tricky for, for stashing or for using Langoliers. Um, there's a question from Shane here on what are your thoughts on Brandon Fott? Um, and would you drop him for any pitchers out on the wire? Um, I'm not huge on, on Brandon Fott. I, I know that he made changes in the playoffs last year and I mm -hmm. respect that those are changes that, that helped him. And I think they do help him a, a little bit. Um, I think he was a little bit overhyped last spring as like a huge difference making starting pitching prospect. I don't believe that he was kind of ever a huge difference making starting pitching prospect, like on the Jared Jones level, um, his ownership, like his, his general manager and manager have all been very open that like he is going to give up hard contact. It's yeah. kind of part of his profile. Um, and so that concerns me a little bit because even with the slider, taking steps in the right direction. I don't believe he's going to miss enough bats consistently to mitigate some of those hard contact issues. I have no problem with Brandon fought, but like a lot of these Red Sox pitchers who looked good early on, who are rostered in fewer leagues like Tanner Hawk and um, like Garrett Whitlock. Um, some of these Tigers guys, Reese Olsen, Casey Mize, um, mm. who I think might get rained out today. Um, yeah. Jack Flaherty. Like I would probably take those guys over Brandon fought right now because I, I think there's a little bit more upside in their, their arsenals. Um, and yeah. I'm curious if you have a different opinion. Not really. Uh, I think that fought was an overrated pitching prospect. It's something I've talked about quite a bit that guys who get a lot of strikeouts based more on deception and on command than on pure swing and miss stuff often struggle in their first taste of major league action. Uh, this was a guy whose fastball was like just one of the worst in baseball last year. Like I yeah. think the run value was five uh, when I was looking at that the other day does have good secondary pitches, does command his pitch as well. I was impressed with what I saw in the postseason. Mm -hmm. My thing with thought is, is he guaranteed to stick in that rotation? Because they've got a lot of names here that can pitch and, if he struggles, they've got some guys they can go to on top of the fact that they just have four really good starters and Eduardo Rodriguez is going to come back pretty soon too. So, yes. or come back soon. So I, I think you can drop him. I'd be really curious who these waiver wire pitchers are, to be honest with you. Like, sure. Right? It does the, depend. The guys like, like if somebody was impatient and dropped Bryce Miller, yeah, sure. Go get, go get uh Bryce Miller or someone of that ilk, but um, certainly don't have a problem holding on to him, but obviously could be upgraded. Yeah. Um, let's use your prospect knowledge here. Uh -oh. um, Trey Lipscomb was called up uh, to essentially be the everyday third baseman for the Nationals. Now that N Nick Senzel, another guy, I mean, yeah. broke his thumb fielding ground balls before a game. You just you feel terrible for him. Yeah. Uh, but what are your thoughts on Lipscomb uh, 12 team head to head league? I'm not a huge fan. Um, I think this is, again, we've talked about it a bunch. I didn't think we'd talk about it this much, but a better real-life player than a fantasy sure. one because he's a pretty good 
a uh, pretty good defender at third base, uh, third round pick back in 2022. Uh, I always think he get, got drafted out of Lipscomb, but nope, that's just his last name. <laughs> uh, we're talking about 45 grade power and maybe 45 to 50 hit. Not a lot of fantasy value in that. I, the playing time is going to be something that helps him. You know, obviously you have to be on the field in order to put up fantasy points. I just don't think he's going to be successful enough. Maybe in an NL only league, you're thinking about as a bench stash, if he gets off to a hot start or he's made an adjustment that I'm not aware of. Uh, right. Not perfect. I have made mistakes before. Dominic Smith is not the greatest offensive player of all time. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I do think that Trey Lipscomb is... Uh, somebody who's going to provide more defensive value for the Nationals and not a lot of fantasy. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, speaking of the same position, but a totally different uh, age profile, uh, MT asks, is there a non-zero chance Eugenio Suarez is a dude this year? New team, fresh flow, maybe not 200 Ks. Um, yeah, maybe not 200 Ks, but he's been basically a 30% strikeout rate guy um, for the last three years. I don't mm -hmm. know that that's going to change. Um, the only thing that might keep him under 200 Ks is, is plate appearances. Um, right. But listen, I, I think he's, I think he has more power than the 22 home runs he hit last year. Sure. I think he could get closer to the 30 he had been before. So are you getting a 230, 240 hitter who hits 25 to 30 home runs? in the middle of a good lineup. Like, I don't know if that's a dude, but I mm -hmm. think that's a usable fantasy player. Yeah. Um, and so I believe in Eugenio Suarez. I like him as a corner infield option. I don't know. I wouldn't be expecting like, you know, what we saw in 2018 and 2019 to come back again. No, but I, but I still think there's value in the profile that he brings for sure. And I do love the fact that he is going to hit in a really underrated and good Arizona Diamondbacks lineup. And I'm, Still very upset with my Seattle Mariners selling a Eugenio Suarez. And while I watched Luis Arias not be able to get a ball 45 feet across the sure. diamond, uh, Luis Arias, excuse me. Um, I do like the profile. And while he, I don't think he can be that 2019 version like we were talking about, I don't think there's any reason to think he can't be the 2022 version. And the 2022 version was a really good right. player. I think he'll help in the RBI category. I'll always believe in that guy's power. He Flew out to the warning track, I believe, 837 times last year, which was very frustrating to watch as a person who was rooting for him to get yeah. that ball over the fence. It's just hard for me to see, uh, think that he's not going to be that 25 to 30 homer guy, maybe give you 100 RBI. You're going to take a hit in average, though. Like, that guy's yeah. swing and miss is not going away. Uh, really good defensive player that's going to keep him in the lineup as well. Yeah, I think Suarez can be maybe not a dude, but like the notch below dude. Sure. A guy, maybe. A guy, a guy yeah. and then a dude. Yeah. Not capital G U I, but maybe capital G lowercase U I. Sure. Perfect. <laughs> there we um, go. we're gonna we got about five more minutes here. We're gonna go to a couple closer questions right now, but keep getting your questions and I'll we'll try to, you know, even get to them as quickly as we can as we wrap up. Sure. Um surprise see Abner Uribe get the early season saves for the Brewers. Safe to say the closer role is his, or will he share with Joe Piamps? Um I don't think it's safe to say it's his at, at right now. I think, um, you know, Pat Murphy, the Brewers manager, has said he is going to mix and match. Right. Um, I think it just so happened that Uribe um, got the second opportunity because the the uh, middle relievers in Milwaukee blew a lead and then they needed a, a save at the end. Right. I don't think it's Piamps, though, because um, they had an opportunity to go to Uribe or Piamps at the end of that game. They went to Uribe again. Mm -hmm. I think if Uribe struggles at all or if they split saves at all it's trevor mcgill um i know that mcgill was used in the seventh inning but for both games he was used in the seventh inning to face francisco lindor and pete alonzo and yeah. so to me that says he is a really trusted reliever for pat murphy they they he, pat murphy believes that mcgill can get tough outs mm -hmm. and so if they're going to deviate from abner uribe in any particular game whether it's matchups or whatever the second guy on the ladder for me would be the guy who's most trusted to get difficult outs right? rather than Piamps who struggled a little bit down the stretch last year. Totally agree. And I really like Uribe. I think long-term, this guy has a chance to be one of the best relievers in baseball. The fact that they are showing confidence in this guy, though, to get save chances in this early portion of the season in pretty tough circumstances. Pitching in New York, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of experience. I really like Uribe, and I do not think that Joe Piamps is going to get many save chances. Yeah, uh, fully agree there. Um, let's go to uh, Rhino is worried about Jose Leclerc. Mm -hmm. His last two outings sucked, droppable, or wait and see. Um, 
I would I I don't know that I would drop fully yet, uh, but I am worried about Leclerc. I didn't yeah. have shares of Leclerc. Um, I felt like th- we've never seen it happen over a full season, and so why would this season be any different? Sure. Um, I I would be willing to stash other pitchers in Texas in case they do move on. Um, David Robertson has a really interesting profile because he gets lefties out really well, and so mm-hmm. he when he was at the Mets last year mentioned that the Mets talked about using him primarily to face lefties. Um, And so that makes me think if Texas is going to do something similar, I could see Josh Spores getting some, some save opportunities. He's looked really good. So I wouldn't cut LeClerc. I would maybe bench LeClerc. Mm -hmm. Um, There is somebody in the, in the chat saying like, if you could get somebody like Jason Foley, Foley, would you job LeClerc? Like, yes. If I, if I could get somebody I knew was locked into a closer role, like even Foley or, or Uribe, or Kevin Ginkle is another one. I think Ginkle is the closer until Seawold is back. If you right. can get one of those guys who we know has a closer's job for Leclerc, I would make that swap. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would bench Leclerc before I would drop him unless I was getting a sure thing in, in return. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, my biggest concern with Leclerc isn't that he's looked bad in these first couple of games. It's the fact that he pitched in approximately 37 straight postseason games. Like sure. that that gives me a lot of long term concern. That and the fact that he's just not that good. He's not terrible mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. And the fact that I think Texas is a really good baseball team going to get a lot of save chances is nice. But you're going to get some four to two saves where he gives up a run or gives up a couple of runs. And it's great that he helps your save stat category. Maybe not helping you a whole heck of a lot elsewhere. Yeah, I, I fully agree on that one. Um, real quick note, Frank asks, should I start Casey Mize today? Quality start league. Um, I, I would. I mean, I don't know if you're going to get full six innings. I don't know if you're going to get. I'm looking out my window right here in New York right now. I don't know if you're going to get a baseball game at yeah, all. That would be my um, but I think if you do, I really like Casey Mize. I don't think the Mets offense is that great. So I would start Casey Mize um, if you have the opportunity to do so. Um, there is a question about um, uh, some starting pitcher ads. Uh, so Jeffrey asks, he said he wants to add a starting pitcher. Should he add Jared Jones, Mitch? I assume this is Mitch Keller. Tanner Houck or Jack Flaherty. Um, I think we both put Jared Jones at the top of that list. Yes. Yep. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Um, Flaherty is next for me with Houck right behind. Okay. Um, but actually like Mitch Keller's in that in, I don't know that we're ever going to see like ace Mitch Keller, right? Like when he started last year and everybody was like, Oh, he, he could win a Cy Young. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I think I would play the matchups with Keller, Houck and Flaherty and Houck gets the angels next, which maybe puts him up higher but jones is is higher than all of those guys for me 100 percent, yeah mitch keller is a too frustrating man it's just too frustrating an experience and i would just recommend staying away from it yes i, I would agree um another question here about uh joe musgrove um keep or drop drop or keep joe musgrove i i can't drop joe musgrove no. Um, I understand it hasn't started out well. This is a guy mm-hmm. with a long track record of being a good and successful pitcher. Um, uh, you know, I want to throw out the Korea starts if possible when they're, you know, pitching early when they haven't had the full time to ramp up like all the yeah. other starters. Um, and so I, I'm not concerned yet. If you want to bench him, fine, go for it. Um, sure. I benched him in, I benched him for Tanner Houck in a couple of leagues because I looked at Tanner Houck's two start week and I thought, I'm going to take that over this one start from Musgrove while Musgrove figures it out, but I I can't advise cutting Joe Musgrove. No. And by the way, uh, you know, I take just taking a look at the numbers for Musgrove. There's been some bad luck here. He's allowed 15 hits and eight in the third innings and only one Homer. Joe Musgrove is going to be fine. This is a guy who's been among the ERA leaders the last three years. I'm not saying he's a fantasy ace, but he's way too good to drop right now. Agreed. Uh, we'll end with a final question. Uh, as a Josh Young replacement, um, Ewe? Ewe wants <laughs> to know, uh, Chris for Morrell or CES, um, shallower format, I assume, Young replacement here, I assume, is a corner infield spot and not just a third base spot. For me, if you're covered at third base, like if you don't need third base, I would rather take CES as a hitter. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have a, any difference of opinion there. No, I I do like Morel, though. Like, I think that he is a solid offensive player. The fact he's hitting cleanup is uh, encouraging sign to scene, too, because, you know, given those, those RBI chances, 
it's not fair, by the way, that he gets no RBIs for those little league, that little league right. homer yesterday. Like he, he did drive himself in technically. And I think the runner of might, although he was stopped, I get it. But anyway, I, I really like CES and it's fun to have CES and EDLC in a lineup, by the way, it's very, very Nintendo ish, but uh, I would go with CES as well, just because I believe in that guy's power so much. And I love yeah. that he plays in an absolute hitting utopia of a park, but Morel is not a bad second option at all. Yeah, and if you are in deeper formats, just looking at Yahoo roster percentages right now, um, you know, we talked about you could pivot uh, to Willie Castro if you needed like a third base speed option. Um, Colt Keith is somebody who's third base eligible in mm -hmm. Yahoo formats um, and could be interesting because he's going to play most every day for the Tigers. Uh, if you're in a really deep format, J.D. Davis is playing every day for Oakland. And so I could see that as a uh, Josh Young replacement um we sure. mentioned his own teammate ezekiel duran is, is third base eligible in a lot of formats and so that's interesting and then i'll also throw out there in like your deepest formats um elahuris montero is yeah. first base third base eligible in a lot of formats he's dh'ing every day for the rockies it has not yet led to anything and it might not lead to sure. anything yeah. um but he plays in coors field and has great power and so if he can make more contact he possibly gets a little bit more run. And in your deeper formats, that might be worth a, a roll of the dice. They, they are in cores this week. So this mm -hmm. might be a week to kind of, you know, they play the Rays at, at home. It might be a week to kind of see what you get out of that. Good call. Good call. Um, that's going to do it for us. Um, so we will be here. Uh, Chris and myself and DJ are going to rotate through on these Q&As throughout the season. Um, it's going to be every Tuesday at one o'clock. We will tweet out the links. Uh, so make sure you're, you're following us. You're following Roto World underscore BB, which is our, our baseball account on Twitter. We'll get that link sent out to you all the time. Um, and if you have questions, you can reach out to us um, on Twitter. I know that right now our Twitter uh, handles are not currently posted, uh, but I am on Twitter at Samsky NYC and Chris is at Crawford underscore M I L B. Uh, so reach out to us on Twitter and we will see you next week for more baseball Q and a.